have Dr. Carol Gunn here, who uh, is uh, from the San Jose Center for Democracy and Human Rights from South Africa. Do you have a presentation, or are you yes, just uh, not um, not an IT presentation? No, no. So yeah, no, no. You don't have a PowerPoint. All right, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, good morning, and thanks for the for the opportunity to present uh, about the Southern Cameroons, which uh, is a, uh, a country that has been in occupation since since 1961, during the the period of uh, decolonization of. Uh, colonial territories of, uh, of Africa. There was a compromise uh, decolonization that was organized for the Southern Cameroons. And because of that uh, compromise decolonization, a territory that was supposed to, to have achieved independence like every other territory, every other colonial territory in Africa, is today you know, uh, virtually annexed uh, and recolonized by, by a neighboring country, uh, La Republic du Cameroon. Uh, the history of uh, the Southern Cameroon dates back to, to 1919. After the uh, First World War, the Southern Cameroon was part of German Cameroon. The territory was partitioned as a war booty between uh, 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 taken from the from Germany and partition and shared between the the UK and, and France. And that territory was administered as a League of Na uh, Nations mandate from 1919 to 1945. And from 1946 up to 1960 it was uh, 1961 it was administered as a UN trust territory under, under the administration of the United Kingdom. So by virtue of, by virtue of uh, a UN resolution 1514, which granted the right to all colonial territories to gain independence unconditionally, the Southern Cameroons you know, was entitled to, to enjoy the same right to self-determination like all other colonial territories. But surprisingly, and uh, up to now, we, we cannot actually uh, explain why the Southern Cameroons was, uh, uh, was not granted in independence. The independence that was, uh, the, the offer that was made to the Southern Cameroon was to make a choice whether to gain independence by joining uh, an already independent state, Nigeria, or by joining another independent state, uh, La Republic du Cameroon. So based on those uh, two, two options, they had to decide either way, and uh, eventually they decided, they, they, they voted in a, in a plebiscite that was organized by the UN on the 11th of February, 1961, the results of the plebiscite indicated that they made the decision to join uh, with La Republic du Cameroon as two states with equal status. But uh, procedures were supposed to, to be followed for that federal, uh, that, that, that federal system to be, to be established, which was supposed to be supervised by, by, by the UK as the administering authority and obviously by, by, by the UN. But that process was never followed, the, the, the process to establish uh, the federal union between uh, the Southern Cameroons and La Republic du Cameroon was never established. And uh, the UK as administering authority uh, unceremoniously uh, just withdrew from the territory without uh, terminating its mandate formally. And so gave uh, opportunity to, 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 to La Republic to you know, just move in uh, its troops and occupy the territory. Uh, resolution 16 uh, 1608, that was uh, passed by the General Assembly on the, on the 21st of April 1961, 
actually set the date for the independence of, of the Southern Cameroons uh, uh, to happen on the 1st of October 1961. But before that day came, uh, the British, as I've just explained, uh, unceremoniously withdrew without terminating the, the, the mandate uh, uh, legitimately or officially. They withdrew on the 30th of September and uh, the, the neighboring country, La Republic du Cameroon, moved in its troops and occupied the southern Cameroons. And uh, yeah, that has been the, the, the history of uh, the southern Cameroons as, uh, as an occupied uh, territory. Several uh, other arrangements happened in the course of you know, these two countries uh, you know, trying to establish a federal union. But, you know, from the position of disadvantage, the Southern Cameroons uh, could not, it, it, it never actually uh, attained independence, and so uh, could not have any uh, negotiations uh, uh, with, with La Republic on, on that uh, status as equal partners. And so La Republic du Cameroon used its uh, position of dominance and has continuously suppressed the Southern Cameroons to this day that we speak. Uh, interestingly, we've been to you know, many forums to try and explain the, the situation of the Southern Cameroon and the question they ask us is, why is it now that we are you know, getting up to, to speak about it? Actually, it's not now that we are getting up. Uh, the, the, the conflict has uh, escalated from October 2016. That is when uh, you know, the world is getting to know that the Southern Cameroon has virtually been uh, a nation that has been annexed by another country. But it is not that, you know, we've stayed for 56 years without, you know, talking about the problem. The issue is, uh, at any moment that you raise a voice in the country to talk about it, you are brutally suppressed. We've had uh, incidences of, you know, our forefathers who actually experience what happened, the, the injustice that happened, when they started, you know, like raising concerns about uh, what was going on, they were caught up and locked up in jail. Several others were forced into exile, and up to today they cannot go back to, 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 to the country. Um, we've had uh, litigation in, uh, at, the, at the level of the African Commission, We've had cases uh, even uh, at the level of the United Nations. But, you know, as uh, international politics will have it, it has been considered as an, as an internal problem. Uh, it is an internal problem between uh, uh, La Republic du Cameroon and, and Southern Cameroon, and they are looking up to, to Cameroon, La Republic du Cameroon, to solve the problem. Now you're asking the same person that has colonized another country to find a solution to the problem. That has not worked until uh, 2016 that you know, the, 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 the crisis erupted and you know, engulfed everybody. Thanks to social media, everybody has become involved. And now the initial demands were for these two states to return to the arrangement that was supposed to, to have been established in 1961. But the government, you know, believes in, uh, in violence and the use of force. From, 19, from uh, 2016, you know, uh, the government used very uh, brutal uh, uh, approach to, to repress and suppress uh, the peaceful protest, uh, protest, protest that were uh, organized across the country. And the situation has now degenerated into an armed conflict, a situation that could have been, you know, could have been resolved peacefully because there is just no explanation why the people of the Southern Cameroons have been denied the right to self-determination. They were denied the right to self-determination in 1961, and every other attempt that has been made, uh, you know, at, at the level of the African Union, at the level of the, 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 the United Nations, to you know, force the Republic to you know, come to uh, a dialogue table and discuss this issue and get to establish the, 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 the Federal Union <laughs> has not worked until uh, currently we are in a conflict where we've had 
more than 3,000 3, people that have died. We've had, uh, we have about um, over 400 internally displaced uh, persons. There are over 50,000 refugees that have you know, crossed over to the neighboring country, Nigeria. And uh, you know, whole villages have been burned down. Over 120 villages have been burned down completely. And you know, the people have been forced to, to, to move to either Nigeria or to re re relocate to, to other parts of the country. So that is the situation in which uh, the, the, the people of the Southern Cameroons, uh, we find ourselves at this moment. And there, are, there, there, there have been reports by other international uh, human rights organizations who have reported about the human rights uh, uh, violations that are going on, you know, summary executions, people are denied the right to travel. Like most of us who are out of the country, you, you just cannot go back home. The moment you get to, to the airport, you are arrested and locked up. And so those home, they, some of them even cannot travel out of the home, out of the country because, you know, so, so much restrictions. And so, but uh, we, we still have the trust, we still have the, the, the strong uh, hope that the United Nations uh, can play a very uh, significant role in, in, in trying to, in, in finding a lasting solution to, the, to, the, to this problem. Because the problem, as uh, many would come to think of it now, they would think is just uh, like violation of human rights, but it goes far deeper than that. It is a denial of the right to self-determination. And uh, we believe that if that root cause of this problem is not resolved, Whatever we do, you know, to, to address the, the, the human rights violations would not solve the problem because, you know, until the, the people of the Southern Cameroons are acknowledged to be entitled to the right to self-determination, to, to, to make a legitimate decision to decide whether they want to continue as part of La Republic du Cameroon or they want to, to become uh, an independent state on their own, which is, uh, what the majority of the people are currently demanding. But you know, we, as uh, the law would have it, we cannot just count on, on uh, popular opinion. So uh, our appeal, our appeal to the UN is if they could create the, the, the opportunity for another referendum for the people of the Southern Cameroon to, 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 to decide their fate, to decide in a referendum whether they want to continue in the union with the Republic of Cameroon, or they want to become an independent state. I think that would be uh, actually taking concrete and practical uh, measures to, to resolve the problem. Other than that, we might have to meet here again in the next two, three years to continue to talk about the same problem. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for that presentation. It was very insightful. Uh, there would be uh, many people sitting in this room who themselves have been victims and have uh, you know, experienced uh, displacement in the war in their various countries. Um, the, uh, the next speaker, that, so thank you. The next speaker we have is Dr. April Thoreau, who is an American international conflict analyst, uh, human rights activist from the USA. Uh, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. One of the difficult things or that I noticed as I traveled throughout the regions of Kurdistan, the four occupied regions of Kurdistan, is the toll that an occupation takes on a people. Understanding the systematic ways that the Kurdish people, over 40 million Kurds throughout southeastern Turkey, northern Iraq, western Iran, and northern Syria, uh, you start to realize the systematic ways in which the four states that occupy these people attempt to control their life, but also to destroy their hope. For instance, in southeastern Turkey, or what the Kurds would term northern Kurdistan, uh, you have over 20 million Kurds who, throughout the decades, have tried to seek a political process, uh, a peaceful political process, to gain their rights. However, every time they do this, their parties are shut down, their leaders are jailed. Currently, the HDP or HDP, Co-leaders are both imprisoned by Ginyi Cektag and Salahuddin Demirtas. 
And you, you see a process where you know, the United Nations and the international bodies are not creating a mechanism where occupied people can achieve their rights. When they attempt violence, they're considered terrorists. They're put on terrorist lists uh, by the same nations that sell the weapons to the states that destroy the villages and kill the people. So you have this great hypocrisy where the United States or the European Union can sell weapons to states that brutalize people, murder people, torture people, and then when these people seek armed resistance, they're declared terrorists. When they seek peaceful political resistance, their leaders are jailed. So the international body is deeply failing the world's occupied people, not just Kurds, the Tamil people, Cameroon, like you spoke about. There's occupations all throughout the world where the people are not given a chance to seek their own self-determination. In northern Iraq, or what they would call Iraqi Kurdistan, or perhaps southern Kurdistan, last year there was a referendum where over 90% of the people voted for independence. Normally, any, any international body would recognize this as this is the will of the people. However, not only did the United States tell them not to hold the referendum, but immediately after, you had a uh, popular mobilization unit, uh, Shia militias from uh, Baghdad, primarily backed by Iran, invaded the city of Kirkuk. Uh, taking this you know, predominantly Kurdish city that has you know, a majority of the oil uh, in southern Kurdistan away from the KRG, the Kurdish regional government. It was a coordinated process. The sad and disturbing fact about this is when these militias did that, they did this with tanks that were provided to them by the United States to the Iraqi government. So you have a situation where the Kurds of northern Iraq voted for independence and they were denied independence. If you look through history, this process has sadly repeated itself over and over. In the 1970s, the father of, of uh, Masoud Barzani, Mustafa Barzani, commented that uh, he had believed that Henry Kissinger would back him because he had you know, even sent him a wedding gift, I believe, or, or something like this. And when he called for, for assistance from the United States, it was denied. Henry Kissinger basically commented that, you know, don't confuse international policy with missionary work. You know, this idea that uh, morals, principles, they go out the window when it comes to international politics. All that matters is power and money. We can't continue to have a system where occupied people throughout the world are not given a means uh, to seek their own self-determination. In northern Syria now, what you could call Western Kurdistan or Rojava, you have a system where the YPG and the YPJ are, have been fighting ISIS for four years have been destroying groups that most of the world would recognize are terrorist groups. However, because Turkey considers them a terrorist group because uh, you know, of the neighboring PKK in, uh, in Turkey, you, know, you have a situation where they were allowed to invade the city of Efrin. And so you had a peaceful city in northwestern Syria, Efrin, where over a million people were living since the, uh, you know, since the um, time of ISIS in Syria in 2014, and the Turkish military was basically allowed to blatantly invade that. And what you have is a situation now where the government of Turkey is almost de facto attempting to annex northwestern <coughs> Syria, all the way from Efrin and Idlib, Al-Bab, all the way to Jarablus. Once again, the Kurdish people of Syria have declared that they want a time routinely hung. They're left to hang on cranes out in the middle of the open to basically teach the Kurdish population, over 10 million people in Rojalat, that they shouldn't resist the Iranian regime. When these executions occur recently, three Kurdish political prisoners were hung recently, when these occur, you almost see no denunciation from the international community. Now, within this region of Eastern Kurdistan, you have, had, you have three, basically, armed movements that are attempting to fight the Iranian government, Kamala, PDKI, and PJAC. Recently, the PDKI headquarters, which is not even located inside Iran, which is located inside technically Iraq, but southern Kurdistan, was attacked by missiles by the Iranian government. There hasn't been any punishment to the Iranian government for carrying out this attack. They basically are able to shoot missiles across the international border, kill leaders of a movement, and there doesn't seem to be any punishment for that. So we need to ask ourselves, what are occupied people supposed to do? If if, we, if they attempt the political process, they're jailed, they're tortured, their families are killed, their villages are burned down. 
If they attempt armed resistance, they're considered terrorists. They're not given any means to, to resist. So how does the international community want people to respond to occupation? If you're an occupied people, what are you supposed to do? Basically cease to exist, accept your social exclusion, accept the fact that you just uh, were unlucky <laughs> to be born in a situation where you're going to be occupied. The United Nations essentially exists for the purpose to contain these kind of disputes. I think it's just as sad when someone dies from an F-16 bombing as from a suicide bombing. But it doesn't make any difference to the victim how they died. Unfortunately, the violence carried out by states is seen as legitimate violence. States can kill people with tanks, with F-16s. This is considered, I guess, uh, clinical, collateral damage, as they say. When rebel movements or guerrilla movements do any kind of resistance, kill a police officer, maybe a police officer that's been torturing their own family, they're considered a terrorist. I can't believe they carried out this kind of terrorist act. There's denunciation across the world. Uh, people consider it you know, almost as if some lives have more value than other lives. Why is it that you know, five Western lives might be equivalent of 5,000 African lives? Why is it that 10 people dying in a terrorist attack in New York City might get 10 times the proportion as 100,000 people slaughtered in the Congo? Why is it, for instance, there's a lot of people, uh, Tamil people in this room from Tamil Ilam. Why is it that the struggle of the Tamil people is ignored? that the Tamil Tigers are considered terrorists, that their leader, even when he goes to surrender, is murdered and nothing happens. There has to be a process where people around the world can achieve freedom under occupation. And hopefully, international bodies like this will start to consider that there needs to either be a legitimate right to resistance, or there needs to be legitimate protections provided by the outside world of these people, whether Kurds, whether people from Cameroon, whether Tamils, uh, there are many of the occupied people around the world. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was very powerful. Um, so the one question we are left with is what are occupied people supposed to do? We have uh, three minutes left, so we have probably time for one question or a comment. Yes, David. Thank you. Um, I want to get back to Peter's question and he said to be put here in this room uh, by one of the members of the Tamil team uh, to the uh, colleague from Western Sahara. And that was a very simple question. Why is it that Western Sahara can organize meetings here sponsored by, I think, 40 or 40 plus states, members of the council? Um, how it, what, how, what explains that? And the answer came, very clear goals from the very outset, uh, from the time of a mishandled um, colonial independence process. Secondly, loud, sustained protest, in that case over a period of 40, 50 years. Thirdly, no violence or certainly no violence against civilians. Fourthly, and perhaps most importantly, strong support from one's own region. So in the case of Western Sahara, over half of the uh, members of the African Union have recognized Western Sahara as a state. I think that's a very loud message. So my only question is to put this question back and to ask everybody to think through similarities and differences in the various movements Obviously, there are significant differences. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone want to respond to that, or just take that for a moment? Do you want to respond? Okay. I, um, I think, unfortunately, the way that uh, comments and questions like this are sometimes parsed is that the only kind of violence that is recognized is what I would call um, literal violence. However, unfortunately, I would say literal violence is maybe five. Or, or so of the actual violence that occurred. State violence, <coughs> structural violence, the kind of violence of dying of poverty, the kind of vi violence that occurs when you don't have uh, vaccinations, the kind, of the kind of violence from uh, famine, the kind, of the, the kind of things that we don't recognize as violence. These things are just as deadly, just as harmful. So uh, I, I understand uh, the question and the, the premise of nonviolence, but I think we need to maybe 
adjust the way that we see nonviolence versus violence. All, violence is a constant. It's always there. It occurs in every situation. There is no way, there is no situation where there's no violence. So we need to ask what are groups who are experiencing the structural violence supposed to do? Because they're dying regardless. If they do nothing, they die. If they resist, they die. So a lot of people would prefer to die standing than die kneeling. And so, um, but yes, to the situation of, the, of Western Sahara, once again, because principles and morals are absent most of the time in international politics, they, you know, the situation with Morocco, uh, obviously they're seen as more powerful than the people from Western Sahara, so they're basically ignored. But um, yeah, I think we should all maybe ask ourselves when we use the word violence, what do we mean? Um, and uh, ask yourself, you know, what, what should these groups do or what would we do if we were in a similar situation? Because I think we would realize that almost everybody would re react in the same way. There's a reason why every resistance movement, every guerrilla movement, uh, you know, uses the same tactics. And when you look at the results that produce them, it's always the same result of why they're produced. Well, thank you very much. Okay, we, we have to wrap up. I'd, I'd like you to extend uh, appreciation to our three experts who have the very deep knowledge of, of the area that they're working in and advocating for. Thank you.